Thank you. So we have another clinical talk here. Uh, we are looking at a, another joint, and uh, I must admit that there may be some repetition uh, of the slides, but I believe that that would help us emphasize some of the facts in the first talk, uh, which we have tried to uh, put forth. So sacroiliac joint, as we know, is uh, a unique diarthrodial joint in the fact that it is relatively immobile. And uh, it functions to transfer the weight uh, from the uh, axial skeleton to the uh, lower limb. Important from this talk point of view is that the anterior third of the joint is a true synovial joint, whereas the posterior two thirds are ligamentous. And we'll see why this is so important. And literature search suggests that about 15 to 30 percent of low back pain are actually from the sacroiliac joint. And there are several differentials. However, inflammatory and infective remain the most common differential, and therefore it also needs a systematic approach to reach a proper diagnosis. Sacroiliitis has gained a lot of importance because it is a hallmark for the diagnosis of spondyloarthritis, which we classify as peripheral and axial, and the axial is classified as non-radiographic and radiographic. The radiographic axial SPA is actually nothing but the ankylosing spondylitis that we all know of, Remember, this is a family of disorders which have some clinical, radiographic, and genetic features. And AS is the prototype, but not the only illness in this disease, because we often see that mistake happening in clinical practice. Sacroiliitis is also an uh, important feature of classification criteria for the axial spondyloarthritis. And as is evident, you just need one more SPA feature to be able to classify the patient as axial SPA. But the important thing is that it's not that a sacroiliac joint involvement means a spondyloarthritis. There are several differentials to this, starting from infective etiology to a structural cause, right up to a bony involvement. And one has to be careful in excluding this before making a diagnosis of an inflammatory sacroiliitis. So the steps in the algorithm, the first step I would say is history. So history-wise, uh, the most common mistake is uh, taking an SI joint pain as a, a, a discogenic pain with radiculopathy. But SI joint pains are typically uh, described as pain in the buttock area, radiating up to the thigh. And the pain may worsen with certain positions, such as changing position in bed. And the pain quality often lacks uh, paresthesias, whereas we know that with radiculopathy, it can be unilateral and it is often unilateral and radiates up to the foot and has neurological complaints. After the history, one looks at uh, ascertaining SI as the source of pain, and there are numerous stress tests to identify the SI joint involvement. And beyond this, a comprehensive examination has to be done to rule out uh, the lumbar spine and hip pathology because they can often be uh, confusing in the history. The next step is determining the nature of pain. Is it inflammatory, infective, mechanical, metabolic, or is there anything to suggest a malignancy? So a young male, less than 40 years, with nocturnal pain, significant stiffness, gets better with activities, with some other features of SPA, would suggest an inflammatory cause, whereas a 24 hours pain, unilateral, fever, weight loss, night sweats, and other things in the history would help you to determine that this is an infective cause. And then, during the examination, one also puts efforts to look beyond the SI joint, the peripheral musculoskeletal site. Is there any enthesitis at the Achilles tendon, plantar fascia? Is there any dactylitis, a synovitis? Or the clue can, can come from an area like the skin, which can show psoriasis, or an area like the eye, which can have evidence of iritis. So once we have crossed this clinical part, then one looks to establish the sacroiliitis on imaging. And the choice of modality actually depends on the duration of disease. So for a chronic duration, for a long uh, symptom, one has to take x-rays or CT as the choice of modality. And x-rays, although difficult to interpret because the, uh, uh, the oblique anatomy of the SI joint, but it can show the features in grade 3 and grade 4 sacroiliitis. And CT, of course, can help you to see the erosions, the sclerosis in a much better fashion, and often also rule out other osseous etiology. In the acute setting, MRI remains the modality of choice, and it is able to pick up what we know as bone marrow edema, which is a marker of inflammation. But mind you, the marrow edema 
can be seen in many other situations, including uh, a stress reaction, and therefore it has to be a significant marrow edema uh, to be able to label it as a significant sacroiliitis. MRI scans have almost a 90% sensitivity in picking up uh, sacroiliitis in patients with spondyloarthritis, and a bone scan uh, can often lead to overinterpretation because of the physiological uptake, and therefore, even though in the past it was used uh, for the acute setting, uh, it is probably best avoided or one has to discuss extensively with the uh, nuclear scan specialist to come to a conclusion on that. On the imaging, uh, whether the disease is unilateral or bilateral helps a lot. So unilateral disease uh, is often infective, and particularly if you see soft tissue involvement, fluid collections, periarticular muscle edema, or a large bone erosion. And this could be in the acute setting, a bacterial one, or in a chronic setting, it could be tuberculosis, brucella, and then one can proceed with aspiration and culture. Whereas on the inflammatory side, it can be an anteroinferior aspect of the SI joints involved with no significant soft tissue. And if this is symmetrical, one is looking at ankylosing or inflammatory bowel disease. And if this is asymmetrical, we are talking about psoriatic arthritis or a particular reactive arthritis. On imaging, one has to be careful also of the potential mimics, like I have depicted here the osteitis condensans alae, which looks like sacroiliitis, but the joint space is normal, there are no erosions, and this is often seen in multiparous women due to stress at the sacroiliac joint. Uh, last couple of slides, the role of HLA-B27 uh, often talked about, it's a golden question, so one has to remember that this is a genetic predisposition, it is not a diagnostic test, it varies across populations and even amongst the diseases that we look at. HLA B27 patient can have an alternative etiology. It's not necessary that he can't have a tuberculosis. Can be negative because there are other genes implicated in the diagnosis, or if you look at an IBD, it's just 30% positivity, so it can be negative. And therefore, it is most useful in the absence of an SI involvement on imaging or when you're making a diagnosis of a peripheral spondyloarthropathy and there are significant SPA features. So uh, this is my concluding slide. Uh, the topic was a diagnostic algorithm and I made uh, efforts to try and put it in the form of an algorithm and I would say the steps would be to suspect an SI joint and ascertain it clinically, then look at the nature of the illness, look for other SPA features on clinical examination, based on the duration of illness, decide about the choice of imaging modality. If it is unilateral, you're suspecting a infection. If bilateral, it is more favorable for an axial spondyloarthropathy. And if your imaging has not helped you, is non-conclusive, or there is no involvement there, and there are SPA features, then comes the role of your HLA-B27, which if positive, will help you to make a diagnosis. And if it's negative, then one has to probably observe for evolution of the disease or think about an alternate diagnosis. So thank you so much for your patient hearing. Thank you.